building preventive health solutions through AI for payers and providers. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's feeling well and well done for making it through to Friday. Delighted to be here today with my esteemed panelists to talk about building AI solutions. Between all of us, we've all tried to build AI solutions for payers and providers. And I will turn to my panelists to tell you a little bit about their history. But before that, I'll share a little bit about Wellex. Wellex is a health and insure tech platform built in the Middle East. And we use AI in two ways. We use AI coaching to get people to develop sustainable behavior change and healthy habits. And we use AI coaching in order to deliver customer support for insurers. Let me turn to my panelists. Krishna, can you introduce yourself and tell everyone what you do? Thank you, Nish. Uh, it's great to be here. So my name is Krishna Murthy, and I'm a consultant surgeon in Imperial College London. I specialize in upper gastrointestinal cancer. And I'm also the founder of a company called Alvi Health. Uh, Alvi is um, a company that provides secondary prevention uh, through a blended human and AI-enabled digital approach for people undergoing acute care treatment. We're starting with cancer, but there's an opportunity to expand into other acute care pathways as well. Kelly, over to you. Thank you, Nish. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly, uh, Kelly Cliffa, CEO and co-founder of Ally Health. And uh, Ally Health, we provide on-demand clinical care to patients in their homes. So we have built a tech backbone to enable high-tech, high-touch interventions. Uh, the reason we work with AI for us primarily is operational, but we've also entered partnerships uh, with digital health companies to help them augment the digital health data they collect with real life measurements. Fantastic, and Simon, I noticed your photo up there isn't you, unless you've got very, very uh, a different appearance from, from before, but Simon, please tell us about yourself as well. Thanks very much, Anushka. Good morning, everyone. I'm Simon Lucas. Uh, I grow stuff in healthcare, particularly in the NHS in the UK, first at Virgin, uh, then at Livy, where I led the growth there, and now doing it at a respiratory and, and long-term condition management startup called Nouveau Air. And I'm really passionate about preventative health, but I'm also a bit skeptical about AI. And for me, you know, I think you'll be really interested to dig into today with this panel around where is it really driving value and where is it a distraction for people who are trying to make an impact in healthcare? And that's a great start to the panel. So I'm gonna ask the most controversial question today. And that is, is anyone really truly doing AI in healthcare? Simon, let me come to you first. Um, I'm not. Uh, for sure. You know, as much as I'm excited by AI, for me, let's be really frank and honest, AI, in my perspective at least, is about COGS management. How do you effectively scale healthcare in a cost-effective way? Now, we know that you know, in the current investment environment, investors are expecting people to scale with a positive unit economic. And so AI is a really powerful tool to enable organizations, to enable startups to deliver preventative healthcare in a way that's cost-effective. If we look at you know, preventive healthcare globally, is done very, very poorly because it's not cost-effective enough. So I absolutely see the potential to unlock a more cost-effective way of delivering healthcare. But right now, my worry is that for a lot of organizations, it's a distraction because the investors are telling people, well, I want to see your AI, where's your AI? And so people are kind of starting from a point of, I've, I need to demonstrate AI, rather than where is it really going to unlock value and help people scale in a cost-effective way. Kelly and Krishna, do you agree? Yeah, I, I agree with your view and actually I think um, a lot of what we're seeing today is companies that are seeing AI as a product um, and not companies that are seeing AI as a capability. And I think when it comes to preventative health, we need all stakeholders involved in the ecosystem to understand and adopt AI and not just having external startups who are doing amazing jobs, but they're coming trying to overlay their product on top of systems that are overburdened. So I think we need that kind of two-sided approach um, and collaboration, really. You mentioned there preventative health. Krishna, maybe I can turn to you and you can share with the audience what we actually mean when we say preventative health and then share your perspective on AI. I mean, prevention, um, I'm gonna sound a bit geeky and academic here, but prevention is three types. There's primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is preventing the disease state from occurring. So for example, people who are already obese, preventing them from getting diabetes, etc. Secondary prevention is where we specialize. These are people who've already got the disease state. They've either got a cardiac event, or they've got a cardiac disease, or they've got cancer already. And thus, you want to prevent the deterioration in health 
and improve recovery and reduce recurrence. And tertiary prevention is people who've already had the event and they are gonna suffer long-term consequences. So you wanna prevent further deterioration in their health. And so I think a lot of the energy is focused on primary prevention, you know, chronic disease conditions, et cetera. But we are, what, we, what, what we need to do is to focus on the secondary and tertiary prevention cohort because they're the ones that cost our payers a huge amount of money because of recurrences, readmissions, et cetera. And I think we've only just touched the tip of this problem so far. So what more can we do in that secondary and tertiary prevention space? I'd love for you guys to share your solutions that you've seen, what's worked, what's not worked, and critically for me, will payers pay for that? I think you asked a key question there at the end, Anushka. Yeah, I love that description there of the different types of prevention. At the moment, my organization is doing a lot of work in that secondary and tertiary interface space. And the most frustrating thing is we can see the fantastic patient outcomes. We can see that we are improving the quality of life for the healthcare professionals who are delivering care and empowering them to do better. But can we convince payers to double run that cost or to make it work in the, in the real time? And we are seeing pockets of that innovation and pockets of that progress. Interestingly, Wales is somewhere where we're getting an awful lot of traction at the moment. They're acting a bit more like a, a unitary health authority. And yeah, the great hope in the UK, at least, is that these integrated care systems that were yeah, the latest three-letter acronym of the, the decade is now beginning to behave a little bit more as a kind of intelligent payer taking a long-term view. One area that I have seen it increasingly done well is Medicare in America, where they've really kind of begun recognizing that they are liable for these healthcare costs till these patients die. And so they're beginning to really think about, okay, how are we going to really manage these patients and do some more intelligent things around preventative healthcare? There's still an awful long way to go, but I think we are seeing now a realization and a shift. We've all seen those cost curves of healthcare. We know that you know, for OECD countries, our, our healthcare systems won't be affordable or fundable beyond 2040, 2050. So we have to do something, and it feels like finally that, that switch is happening. Brilliant, and almost on cue, we have Dr. Wolf join us. I'll let you take a moment to introduce yourself. Hello. You are super punctual. Um, uh, uh, hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Justus. I'm a PhD in experimental bioinformatics. I published a lot on AI implementation in healthcare, and we work with major health insurances for a long time on digital health and AI implementation. Brilliant. So let me come to you, Dr. Wolf. Can you tell us a little bit about where implementation in AI has worked from your experience and where it's maybe not yeah. worked? Yeah, um, I mean, I, in my personal case, have a lot to do with diabetes, for instance, diabetes care. Um, we um, have analyzed, I mean, academically, I have analyzed um, also cardiac and uh, cardiac uh, cardiology events. But in diabetes, for instance, at the moment, there's a major program going on with 26,000 patients in Germany where we uh, predict the comorbidity development. So we basically say, okay, you have diabetes, but do you have a risk of getting heart insufficiency, chronic kidney diseases, and so on? and then we early intervene. So we cannot avoid, in this case, the diabetes, but we can intervene the comorbidities, as one example. So we try to use AI from a predictive modeling perspective to actually say, okay, as early as possible to intervene and actually steer the patient into a direction where we know he has a high likelihood of developing a disease. And Kelly, I know Ally Health does a lot of work in that directionality and ensuring that the customer gets the right place. What's your perspective on this? Yes, yeah, so our perspective is actually um, the work that we've done with AI and preventative health has actually been targeted more on the life insurance sector. And what we noticed there is we've partnered with a company called Alula Health, um, and Alula uses ML um, to provide a real longitudinal view of a health risk score for patients. And from a life insurance perspective, there's a clear business case. Um, there's also a, a, a huge amount of data that they're gathering through the lifetime of their uh, plan owners. So we're deploying that tool across their, um, across their plan owner, life insurance clients, um, to help them really get on top and use AI to adjust behavior and understand the risk scores. Uh, we are augmenting it as ally with real life measurements and really cross-checking uh, cross the reliability of that data. Um, so that's where we've seen it work quite well. Fantastic. It sounds like what we're doing at Wellex, but we do it in health insurance. And I want to come to the panel then and ask you about these things called scores and the algorithms that sit behind AI. Going a little bit on a tangent here, does it work? AI in sports? 
So using AI data to build scores to then influence behavior. I, I, I mean, my experience is really with the data that I have on a physician's side. Yeah? So this is, uh, my PhD was in privacy preserving machine learning. How can we access the data that it are within a med medical unit? So when we talk about predictive models in AI, it's about age, gender, BMI, lab values, medication, diagnostic results. That's, that's my world. If I'm talking about sports, I would say like, yes, if you are in a continuous monitoring scheme where I have these kind of data sets, okay. Otherwise, I mean, just from a bioinformatics per perspective, it will be hard because you're in a lifestyle field. Yeah. I'm, so what I do know or what we know in academia as well is if you have these kind of data sets, okay, yes, we can really intervene. Theoretically, in sports, yes, same way possible, but then I need all of these data points that I just mentioned. So let's move across and talk about the challenges then. Now, we know that bias comes up a lot in discussions about AI and, and the fact that you know, bias in healthcare can truly impact not only the modeling, but then what you do in terms of the intervention. Krishna, let me start with you. How do you deal with bias in your business and what are the other challenges you face with AI? I mean, there are the bias mainly is uh, I want to come to Simon's first point first about AI and secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is still very hospital-based. And because it's hospital-based, you know, the equity of access is a real challenge. So cardiac rehabilitation, the evidence for cardiac rehabilitation is so strong. But even today, less than 30% of people access cardiac rehabilitation purely because of access issues, etc. And also workforce. The NHS, for example, doesn't have the workforce to meet the demand of cardiac rehab. So AI makes it more cost effective and also makes it more accessible <coughs> through digital platforms. So that does bring bias, right? Because the people who then you train your algorithms on are actually the people who probably don't need your secondary prevention as much because they're the ones who don't access your hospital-based services. So that's one challenge in terms of bias. But as you, but you know, we are in a very exciting era in digital, which I'm sure we'll all agree, and that's why we are here. The number of people even undergoing cancer treatment in the NHS, even I was surprised myself, they can use these digital platforms, 70 to 75% of people. So the algorithms that we're training are not really that biased, but we are still, there's a whole section of the population that we're not accessing, and I think we should, and that does create an element of bias. The challenge, at least for my company, is that when we train our algorithms, we need to train them against an output and an output that we don't control, the output that is lying in the databases of the healthcare organizations. And that's lying in a silo. And I, and I would request the NHS, and I even challenge the NHS to make that more accessible. So you know, companies like us can access that data to train our algorithms with the ultimate aim to benefit the NHS because we want to scale this up so everyone can benefit from this. And that's definitely something we're facing as well. And, you know, we've, we've all been on panels before that data fluidity has been the biggest challenge. Being able to connect data between payer provider, being able to connect data even just between providers and between primary and secondary care. And Simon, I know you did a lot of work with this at Livy when we worked together between uh, ourselves. Maybe you can share your perspective on how we influence that data p uh, fluidity to, 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 you know, break down the barriers of building AI. I, I think the relationship between organizations, whether it's commission and provider, between providers within the system is essential. And if we look at the inefficiency in healthcare, right, how do we address that cost curve in healthcare is about using the resources we've got more cleverly. And I think the duplication we've all experienced on a first-hand basis, you know, something that we worked quite closely with was, you know, as an insurer commissioning a provider, what could we safely share? What was appropriate to share? What wasn't appropriate to share? How could we get real-time information sharing? You know, what was the reliability of the APIs? What do you do when the API goes down? Really basic nuts and bolts sorts of challenges there. I think my other reflection when you, you touch on the, kind of bi the challenges with AI, you know, I don't want to disregard the, the problems around bias. Those are real challenges. But for me, I guess the bigger challenge is a bit more meta. It's a bit more about the patient perspective. You know, something in my current organization, we do uh, a lot of kind of one-to-one -one health coaching, you know, actual intelligence, heaven forbid. But you know, we talk about as scaling empathy. And so you know, we build one-to-one -one personal relationships with patients. And through that, we've been able to achieve phenomenal engagement scores, things we never thought possible with some really difficult cohorts. And as we look to try and blend that coaching model with bots, with AI, with other tools that are more scalable, 
how do you maintain that, that real accountability? Because yeah, if we look at what's driving that engagement, it's the, the, the person, the patient, the individual being helped feels accountable to someone else. And I think as you kind of bring more blended models in or kind of ultimately computerized models in, how do I still feel responsible? You know, am I going to be adherent to my medication? Am I going to feel that I should do the, the right behaviors that are ultimately going to lead to the right preventative outcome? Or if it's just a, a reminder on my phone, is it easy to swipe away and ignore it? And so you know, that personal interaction with AI is really key. And I think you know, we've all had to play with large language models, right? We've all kind of had to play in, you know, is this my new friend or not? And we've seen those limitations quite quickly when these things can't mirror the empathy that we're looking for. So for me, unlocking the empathy piece and making sure people feel personally accountable is going to be really key to leveraging these tools. Otherwise, it's just the next iteration of a chatbot. And that's a really interesting phenomenon because I know generative AI is the term that's been thrown around a lot recently. What, Simon, you're referring to is that humanistic AI. I'm going to take a pause here and just turn to the audience. How many of you would trust an AI chatbot if it felt like a human to deliver medication messages to you, healthcare messages. I'm seeing quite a lot of shaking heads, but can I just see a raise of hands? How many, how many people would be comfortable doing that? Yes for comfortable. Okay, so about 30%, and I guess the rest are no. How many people are unsure? Okay, I'd love to come to you in a second and just ask what would make you more sure, but perhaps we can just explore the challenges a little bit more. Um, Dr. Wolf, maybe you can share with us your, your challenges. Well, um, I mean, the talk is called um, Solutions um, for Payers and then Providers. So for payers, I mean, a major challenge that I see, and, and I mean, over the years we have worked with Allianz, MetLife, NHS, TK, and so on, you have to defend the investment that you take into these AI solutions. So um, uh, one of my publications is called The Economic Impact of AI in Healthcare in Jamia, and um, uh, we basically tried to analyze how much do we know about the medical and economic impact of AI. And if I'm a payer, I want to know what I'm doing here. I want to really have a hard figure on, on the solution that I'm implementing. And the research also has shown that we don't have enough evidence, or at least we don't collect enough on that. And we have to have, and this is addressing your question, what is a challenge? We need to address this challenge of measuring the impact of AI. If I'm a major health insurance, a major payer, a major government, I need to also demonstrate and know what is my impact here. So this is from my perspective, medical and economic impact is a, is a major challenge we need to address. It is addressed now in some indication areas, but this is really something where we know we have to do more, more research on also. You raise a really good point, and I have this challenge in my business every day of how do we actually measure the impact of what we implement in, in the artificial intelligence space or the augmented intelligence space. Because within healthcare, I think where we're at now in the, in the paradigm is we're at augmented intelligence. You've still got the clinician involved at each stage to be able to validate, to be able to check, and to be able to inform that model. Simon, Kelly, Krishna, I want to hear how you're measuring AI and the uh, value of it. Uh, maybe I'm oversimplifying things, but for me, it's COGS management, right? When you're sitting there running a PL, you've got your staffing costs, you've got your revenue side, how much does that technology that you've invested in enable you to scale that clinical capacity x more? You're getting 2x, 3x, 4x more out of it. So you know, uh, where I used to work at Livy, you know, one of the kind of applications that was being introduced was for nurse chat. So in Sweden, uh, we had a, a service whereby patients could send a message in to a, a nurse service and get an asynchronous message back. We started applying a large language model to an augmented a, yeah, AI approach whereby the, the message was initially drafted based off the input, but the nurse still reviewed that message. And it went from nurses being able to do you know, four messages in a 15-minute window to eight messages in a 15-minute window. So very quickly, you could justify that cost. So for me, you know, perhaps oversimplifying, I recognize in some areas it unlocks vastly more, but it's just a matter of what's your cost base for your staffing or your other cogs, and how much does that enable you to scale more through that investment? Kelly? Yeah, on our side, uh, we see AI really in our operations as an enabler. So we actually measure the impact in terms of as we deploy AI to optimize the routes of our nurses, how many more patients can they see and how more efficient can we make that preference-based planning that we're using for these interactions. Um, so it's really, back to your point, Simon, for us, um, we really believe in the human touch and that as the crucial element to nudge people towards better behaviors and better outcomes, um, ultimately. So 
for us, that's how we measure it, is operations. Are we delivering a better human-driven interaction? And potentially then working alongside other digital health providers who anchor AI as the main patient channel, if you'd like. That makes sense. Krishna, anything to add? You know what? I have to echo that. The term enabler is the appropriate term. I think AI is just enabling the workforce right now to work more efficiently and work to a greater capacity. You know, so for example, before we started using AI, my coaches would have about 30, 40 data points that they had to look at to then prioritize the areas of health impairments to create these personalized programs. Now AI can just surface that data and highlight to them which are the areas that need, they need to focus on. So it's just making it more efficient. I don't think we are at a point right now where AI is going to replace a healthcare workforce. It'll make it more efficient and focus, you know, get the best value from the workforce that we have, which is slowly diminishing. You know, it's, it's actually shrinking across the world. Even in the US, the workforce is shrinking. So AI is just an enabler. And the other interesting point I want to make, Simon, in terms of you raised that issue about uh, you know, empathy. There was an article in JAMA just a few months ago where they actually did a trial of human-delivered coaching versus GPT-delivered coaching. And the GPT was more accurate and also more empathetic. And this was published in JAMA just a few months ago. So I think this is an exciting era we're coming into. But I think it's going to take a lot more research, etc. That's interesting, right? We all assume that humans are empathetic, but maybe that's an assumption we need to challenge. One of the factors that we've talked about is how AI can influence and maybe breed more capacity in the workforce, acknowledging that workforce challenges exist across the healthcare ecosystem. But we haven't touched on that concept of health equity and health inequity, which has become very, very poignant, particularly in the post-pandemic world that we now exist in. So I would love to ask my final question to the panel and center it around, can AI improve health inequity, not only in the developed world, but also in the developing world. I'm going to come to Kelly first on this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried about that, actually, for me, because, um, I mean, this is something we mentioned earlier, but the data sets that we are using and the black box that ultimately sits at the core of many of these, um, these AI interventions make it so hard for us to, to, to really pro provide um, advice that is suited to all backgrounds, to all races, etc. So it's deeply, um, it's, it's deeply flawed at this stage. And I think as we deploy it to more preventative health pathways, this is going to be a magnifier of, of those, this bias, algorithmic bias. Um, but it's also a platform to start pinpointing where the bias is happening because we are collecting more data points and we are able to then say, okay, these are, these are the, the yeah, planes of bias, if you'd like, that we can tackle. So that's hopefully good for equity in the long term. Amazing. Justice? Well, I, my short answer is I, I do think AI is the, the key to solve the lack of uh, HR resources that we have in healthcare. And to just address your point of black box of AI thinking, Yes, also Bill Gates said that two days ago, we haven't 100% understand it, but by the way, we haven't 100% understood our own brain as well, how we think. Um, and I would uh, say there are good um, models um, where you see how an AI thinks. For instance, random forest models where you can really say like, okay, how did, do you actually come to a um, decision? And I think this will help us in solving this black box issue. This is my only comment on that. Thank you. Brilliant, Simon and Krishna, anything to add? Uh, it may not be an entirely popular or perhaps even sensible view, but I can't help but remember hearing Ali Parsa talk seven or eight years ago. And, you know, Babylon, never mind the outcome, ultimately was trying to get to a zero marginal cost of healthcare. And if you look at what they you know, deployed to Rwanda and what they were trying to do there, you know, a lot of those kind of intentions, I think, were the similar sorts of things that we're trying to do now. Now, then, you know, it comes down to every, the thing we all have to worry about, which is execution. It's all going to well having a great idea or a visionary idea. If you can't execute and deliver upon it, then you're not going to be able to realize the benefit. But I do still think that a lot of those you know, things they were trying to do at Babylon probably were with the right intent and proving out the sorts of challenges that we're discussing now. Fantastic. I was wondering who would mention Babylon first. Anyway, to conclude then, I'd like to thank all of you for sharing your perspective. I guess for me, the last question then is, or the last uh, point would be, if I could ask you to say 
in your words, what's the one word to describe the future of AI in healthcare? What would the word be? Let me come to Justus first. Promising. Promising, Simon? Three words, still a way off. That was four words, still a way off, just, yeah. The two words, carefully optimistic. Okay, and last and last not least. And for me, one word, it's about access. It'll improve access to healthcare. Fantastic. So I'm going to call that overall a positive approach or a positive way of thinking about AI. For me, the word would still be it's augmented, not artificial. And I want the panel to, to um, share that, that view and, and for, for all of you to take that away. Thank you, everyone, for listening to us today. I've been Anushka Bachar, and we've been talking to you about AI and healthcare.